want to challenge you this morning to go, to do, to say, and to give what Jesus is calling you to do. I'm going to get into your business this morning. Is that okay? Amen? Oh, wait a second. Wait a second. I got some brothers and sisters from Africa, right? Now, if I say amen and you're silent, that's, that's just not right. Okay? I'm going to get into your business today and I'm going to challenge you to not be satisfied with the false gods of career and money and power. I'm going to challenge you to live for the kingdom of God. Amen? Amen. There we go. I like that. Jesus is our king. Jesus is not only the savior of the world, he is king over all. And he is calling us to live lives in obedience to him. I believe that in this room this morning, some of you will live only for your careers and for power and for money. But there's a few of you in here they're gonna, that are going to return home and transform your tribes, your communities, your cities, and perhaps your nation. And I am so excited because I believe before we can transform communities and nations, we must first experience the smell of the presence of Jesus Christ. Amen? One of my favorite characters in the Bible is Peter, the apostle. Now, Peter, this guy is, is crazy, right? So Jesus is walking on the water, and who's the first person to, like, jump out and try to walk to Jesus? Peter. When Jesus says, who do the people say that I am? Who is the first person to open his mouth and say, you're the Christ? Peter. Um, uh, the mountain of transfiguration, right? It's Elijah, Moses, and Jesus. Who's the, who's the one that opens his mouth and says, let us build three tents here for you? Peter. Who's the one that goes running to the tomb of Jesus after his death and resurrection? It's Peter. We jump into the book of Acts, and Peter's preaching, and 3,000 people believe. Peter's preaching, and 5,000 people believe. Persecution comes. He's thrown in jail. He gets out of jail. Peter keeps preaching the gospel. I mean, this guy's incredible, right? When you look at Jesus' uh, Peter's life, do you think, I'm nothing like Peter? At the end of Peter's life, he was going to his death in Rome, in church tradition tells us that Peter insisted that he died differently than his Savior and King. So he was crucified upside down. You go, <laughs> I'm not Peter. I'm just Chris, right? I don't have that kind of courage. I've never, and I can never do the things that, that Peter did. You feel, and I feel, this cognitive dissonance. Here I am. Here Peter is and I could never be like him. We want to be like Peter and live wholeheartedly a life for Jesus Christ. We want to live a life on mission, but we get stuck. We can't get past our past. We, we can't move past our sin, our disappointment. The question this morning is how do we go from our excitement at the vision conference to the reality on your campus and applying what we've heard this week. I believe the Holy Spirit is here with us this morning. And I am going to pray for you and for myself, but I first want you to take a moment to pray for your heart that the Holy Spirit would speak to you in these next minutes. So let's pray. Ask the Holy Spirit to speak to you right now. Jesus, I stand before this group as your servant. I simply want to say the words that you would have me to say. Holy Spirit, we invite you into this place in a powerful and real way. In Jesus' name, amen. I'm going to tell you a story, a story from the Bible, and I want you to use your imagination. I think when we study the Bible, we use our minds all the time, but we don't use our imaginations enough. I want you to imagine you're a character in this story, Perhaps you're someone who is watching in, and I want you to feel and smell and, and put yourself in this, in this experience. I think doing this can deeply enrich in your Bible study. Okay, you ready? Amen? All right, here we go. 
we're in a large room together. It's a second story in Jerusalem. Peter and John have come. They've prepared a Passover meal. We, we've eaten roasted lamb, a cracker-like unleavened bread with olive oil and honey. Perhaps we've had dried figs. Can you, can you taste them? We have drunk some wine. Jesus, our rabbi, has shocked us by telling us that someone at our dinner table is going to betray him. He then makes a shocking, another shocking declaration and prediction. He says that Peter's faith would fail him and that he would turn his back on Jesus. We think, Peter? No. The brave one? The bold one? The first to act? The first to speak? Not Peter. And, and Peter, of course, Peter responds, Lord, I am ready to go with you both to prison and to death. And here are Jesus' painful words in reply. I tell you, Peter, the rooster will not crow this day until you deny three times that you know me. Just a few hours later, Jesus has been taken. Peter's in the courtyard of the high priest. And, and Peter is so curious with what's going to happen. It's cold like it's cold outside in Baltimore this morning. So someone lights a charcoal fire. And by the light of this charcoal fire, a servant girl looks into Peter's face and says, this man was with Jesus. Peter looks at her in shock and says, woman, I, I don't know him. Someone else says, you are one of them. And he responds, no, 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 I'm not. About an hour later, someone else says, yeah, he is from Galilee and must have been with Jesus. For a third time, Peter denies knowing Jesus. As he speaks, the rooster crows. Can you hear it? Jesus turns and looks right into Peter's face. Brokenhearted, Peter gets up, goes outside, and weeps bitterly. The gospel writers want us to understand very clearly that this happened by a charcoal fire. Can you smell that fire as you hear the rooster crowing and hear Peter weeping because he, the bold, fearless one, has just denied his teacher and friend? Here's my question this morning. How do we reconcile the cowardly Peter at the charcoal fire saying, I don't know the man, and the bold, courageous Peter that we see in the book of Acts? How do we explain the weeping Peter who's ashamed of his rabbi and the one who's crucified upside down because of his great love for him? You see, you and I can be excited about sharing the gospel. We can say, yes, I'm going to go on a Bridges missions experience. Um, yes, I'm going to talk to my parents about Jesus. But then reality hits us. And we get stuck in our battle with pornography. We get stuck in some sexual sin. We want to share the gospel with our dad or mom. But then we remember, they never seem to really love us. It's like they loved their careers more than us. We want to go on a summer mission, but we're really worried what our advisor would think if we asked for two weeks off. How are we supposed to deal with the gap between who we want to be, the Peter of Acts, and the sin and the cowardice that often seems to grip us, the Peter by the charcoal fire? Friends, I believe the Bible tells us how. Isn't that good news? Amen? Amen. Let me tell you how. Let's set the scene. Jesus has died. He's been resurrected. He's appeared to the disciples off and on, but they're not exactly sure where he is. Andre referenced this story a few minutes ago. What does Peter decide to do? He's a good old boy. If in doubt, what does he do? He goes fishing. So he takes six of the disciples. They go fishing. They don't catch anything, even though they're professional fishermen. All night, they catch nothing. Jesus appears to them at the shore, tells them to cast on the right side of the boat. They catch 153 fish. John tells Peter, that's Jesus. 
And, and, and you can guess, Andre told us what Peter does, right? He, he jumps into the water off the boat, swims to Jesus because he can't wait to get to Jesus. And let's pick up the conversation there. Let me read. When Jesus and the disciples had finished eating, Jesus spoke to Simon Peter. He asked Simon, son of John, do you love me more than the others do? Yes, Lord, ans he answered. You know that I love you. Jesus said, feed my lambs. Again, Jesus asked, Simon, son of John, do you love me? He answered, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. Jesus said, take care of my sheep. Jesus spoke to him a third time. He asked, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Peter felt bad because Jesus asked him a third time, do you love me? He answered, Lord, you know all things. You know that I love you. Jesus said, feed my sheep. What I'm about to tell you is true. When you were younger, you dressed yourself. You went wherever you wanted to go. But when you are old, you will stretch out your hands. Someone else will dress you. Someone else will lead you where you do not want to go. Jesus said this to point out how Peter would die. His death would bring glory to God. Then Jesus said to him, follow me. Friends, can you smell this scene? Can you smell it? Yeah, yeah, we, we do have a stinky fisherman, body odor, fish. It's a little stinky. I'm talking about a different smell. It's the smell of a charcoal fire. Luke makes very clear that this was a charcoal fire. Do you, do you think this was by accident? Did you know that that smell triggers our memory more than any other sense? Growing up, I spent my summers in West Michigan. My grandparents and uncle were hog farmers, pig farmers. And we would drive past Chicago up into West Michigan. And that smell of pigs, most people don't like it, but I loved it. Because it was the smell of grandma and grandpa Jipping's farm. My wife, Monica, was in a Bible study a few years ago. And there are a lot of older women in this Bible study. And someone had the same perfume on that Monica's beloved grandmother, Mima, would wear. And she almost broke down weeping because she couldn't concentrate on the Bible study. She was thinking about her grandmother. Can you smell this charcoal fire? Here, Jesus uses the smell of the fire, but he also uses bread and fish. Remember how Jesus had multipli multiplied fish and bread? Remember how Jesus had said, I am the bread of life? Jesus had told Peter he would be fishing for men. So Jesus uses Peter's sense of smell and of taste to touch Peter's heart with his presence and assure him of his forgiveness and love. Notice how many times Jesus asked the question, do you love me? Three times. How many times did Peter deny Jesus? Three times. Do you think that's by accident? I don't think so. There's, there's several lessons here, and I'm going to close with, I think, three vital lessons. First, fires are going to come into your life that break you. In God's providence, he uses something terrible. It's not good that Peter denied Christ. But he did this to break Peter's confidence in his own abilities. By this first fire, Peter is proud. He's confident in his own ability. He said, I would never deny Christ. He thinks he can stand up for Jesus in his own power. But three questions and a, a crowing rooster and the stare of Jesus show Peter otherwise. He is a broken, weak man whose natural gifts and abilities can only get him so far. God has to break you with the first fire to get you to the place where he can use you. But a second fire comes into Peter's life, and I believe second fires come into our lives. The other fire, and this is the beautiful smell of the presence of Jesus, assures us that Jesus is with us. We can't be the Peter of Acts until we've been the Peter by the charcoal fire. Can you smell the grace of God 
And here Peter telling you and I, friend, I know that you are broken. I know that you feel unable to do what I am calling you to do. And Jesus' question to you and to me is, do you love me? Do you love me? Do you love me? Yes, Jesus, I love you, but that's all that I have. And Jesus looks down and says, I I can take your brokenness and your insecurity and your fear. And Jesus smiles and says, good. You, my son, you, my daughter, you feed my lambs. Take care of my sheep. This is, this is the strangest thing to me. We might think that it's our shameful, painful life experiences that prevent God from using us. Okay? But often the opposite is true. It's the painful, broken experience that God uses us to make us depend on Him and His presence. Remember Peter being crucified upside down? Peter understood that sin turned the world upside down and only Jesus can set the world upright. In Jesus' upside-down world, upside-down kingdom, he uses our brokenness to accomplish his purposes. He allows one charcoal fire of pain to come into our life so that he can bring another charcoal fire where he sits with us and his very presence is there with fish and bread to remind us of his deep and great love for us. The second fires that come into our life allow us to serve Jesus because these fires are grounded in his very presence with us. We experience his love, his forgiveness, his restoration. Have you experienced the presence of Jesus in that way, my friend? Last point. A third fire is in this story. We don't see this third fire until, until the book of Acts. And that fire is the fire of the Holy Spirit. The fire of the Holy Spirit comes and empowers the disciples, and he empowers us to share the love of Jesus and live a life on mission. Remember this in Acts 2? The fire of the Spirit comes down and rests on each of the apostles. As Jesus had promised, God the Spirit descends on Jesus and his followers and fills them with his presence. The apostles are filled with the new power to do what Jesus is calling them to do. Jesus' followers, including me, including you, have been empowered. Can I say that again? We've been empowered to live the mission that God's calling us to. Can I get an amen to that? You have power. It's not an ordinary power. It's the very power in the presence of God himself. He fills you. He allows you to go on summer mission. He allows you to share the gospel with your mom who's broken your heart. He allows you to forgive your father. He allows you to share your faith with that classmate or that roommate that you have trouble loving well. You see, three fires come into Peter's life, and I believe three fires come into our lives. One fire breaks us. One fire restores us to the presence. These are not actual fires for us, but these are experiences that God brings into our life. And the last fire fills us with the very power and the presence of the Holy Spirit. The same happens in our lives today. I believe that God's calling you to a special year in 2018. God wants to do special things in your life, and God wants to use you to transform your campus and your nation. My question is, Will you be obedient to do that? You say, I'm I'm, I'm new to this Christian thing. Or you say, I'm so sad and depressed. I don't feel the presence of Jesus today. And my encouragement to you is, wow, you do have a lot in common with Peter. Because Peter was able to get past his shame and brokenness because Jesus was with him. God's calling you to something today. I don't know what it is, but I know God is speaking to your heart in some way. Maybe he wants you to join a Bridges leadership team. 
Maybe it's going on a summer mission. Maybe it's forgiving someone or sharing the gospel with someone. I don't know what it is. But I know that God is with you, that Jesus' very presence is with you, and I know that he sent his Holy Spirit to empower you to do what he's calling you to do. Can I get an amen? Amen. This is good news, friends. I'm going to pray for myself, and I'm going to pray for you that we can live lives in 2018 surrendered to God's will and his plan for our life. Let me pray for you and pray for myself. Glorious Father in heaven, we acknowledge that you are the King of all kings and the Lord of all lords. You're a God who someday every tribe, tongue, and nation is going to be in your presence, bowing before you, worshiping you, and we want to be part of that. I pray for my brothers and sisters here from all over the world that they would not settle for the false gods of power or wealth or their careers but that they would live lives surrendered to your kingdom purposes because they have smelled your presence and experienced you and because you've empowered them with your Holy Spirit. We thank you, Holy Spirit, that you are with us, and we pray that you would use us in mighty ways in 2018. In Jesus' name, amen.